Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, I want to revisit the microscope LED replacement project. Once again, there has been some changes to the microscope and also some more investigations that I've done. I think it's going to be pretty interesting for me to share with you my findings here. So this is what a normal halogen-based lamp looks like. This is the HAL 100 and this is a 100 watt lamp. And if I open it, you can see there's a big heat sink in here, unsurprisingly, because this thing does produce a tremendous amount of heat. And inside of it, we can see we find one halogen lamp. And the lamp has a mirror in one side, it's a reflective mirror, it gets as much of the energy forward as possible through this aperture. And if you look through the lens, you can actually kind of see the filaments in focus. And that's what you want. In order to get the color illumination from the light source, you want the filaments to be in focus. And there are adjustments here to do that, to move it in different directions, to really put it in focus, which is already done for this light. Now this is great because what you really want is a point source of light. And that's the point I was a little bit missing originally because you want, them, this is not a problem we can solve with optics later on. You can't have a big aperture of light because ultimately all you can do is project your light source onto your sample. And for a color emanation, you want a really perfect projection of that. So the larger the aperture of light is, the harder this problem becomes. And most of that light energy is completely wasted when the aperture of the light source is big. And that's one of the reasons they use the halogen lamp here. But the halogen lamps have one major disadvantage, and that's the color temperature coming out of them is a function of how much energy you put into them. And that's where the term, you know, how many degrees of Kelvin there are in a light actually comes from. It refers to what would be the spectral emission of a tungsten filament at that temperature. So if I heat this up to 6,000 degrees Kelvin, then it will be a very white kind of looking light. But if I dim it to 2000 degree, then it's going to be very yellow. So adjusting the intensity of the light of this changes the color temperature, which for viewing samples on a microscope is quite inconvenient. And this is why microscopes have a lot of neutral density filters. So you shouldn't switch in filters as opposed to attenuating this. But that can be annoying, as we will see. So that's why I wanted to have an LED light source with a good color uh, rendering index so that I just don't have to worry about that. And you can, you can dim an LED without changing its spectrum very much at all. So I built this originally, and this has an LED array on the inside of it, you can see. But this was the wrong approach because this is a very large aperture light, and therefore it wouldn't really do what we want. We can fix that, as I said, with optics. So even though it works, almost all the light this generates is wasted. Only the very few elements in the middle actually contribute to illuminating the sample. So we have to find a different approach. And a couple of people suggested one LED that I could buy that was really, really bright in a single kind of point source. So I went and I bought that. And I looked around for a housing for it, and Tor Labs actually has one of those. Let me show you what it looks like. So here's what we have. I've taken it apart so you can take a close look. So this is the chassis of that LED. Now this used to come in with a 5 watt LED, but I replaced it with this one, the one that I bought from DigiKey, and I'll put, post the part number so you can take a look at it, and it puts out a tremendous amount of light. But it is 25 watts now. And because it's 25 watts, this is no longer enough. The other piece of this, was the piece over here. This is the lens, and this just simply screws into this. But because the heating was getting too much and the LED would then you know, have a significantly reduced lifespan, my brother 3D printed this little piece over here. And that nicely clips onto this, and the fan over here blows right across the heatsink when you put it all together. So I think it's a really nice, elegant solution, because now you can just put this in the back of the microscope, and you can put 25 watts into this and get a tremendous amount of light from this. So let me reassemble this so you can take a look at what it looks like. And here's what it looks like when it's all closed up. There it is. It attaches to the microscope from this side. And if you look carefully, you can see that it brings the LED light source exactly into focus there. And at the same time, this fan and this LED are have roughly the same voltage. So the voltage across the LED is you know, reasonably constant. It has an exponential IV characteristic. So this thing just basically spins as soon as the LED turns on. And it keeps it at a very nice temperature. So I installed the two lights under the microscope. And here are the two cables that come from them. Now, an easy way to drive this is just connect this to some kind of a constant current power supply, and then you can adjust the brightness without any issues. But what would be missing is then be able to control them from the microscope itself, because the microscope does have intensity control, and it has two connectors in the back, which those halogen lamps plug into. And this is a very powerful power supply, obviously, because it needs to drive the halogen lamps. It also has the ability to switch the top or the bottom light. So if I don't use this, I basically lose all of this control that's on the microscope, which I want to maintain. Now, at the same time, I can't just connect those LEDs directly to the power supply here because this power supply is controlled from 1 volt to about 13 or 12 and a half. And that's completely unsuitable for those LED lights, not to mention that they need a constant current driving and the halogen lamp doesn't have any of those. So what I really want is I want somehow to translate the voltage coming from here into controlling a constant current power supply to control the brightness of the LEDs. 
Now this is not a difficult thing to do. You can actually do it entirely in the analog domain. All you're doing is translating one voltage into another set of currents. And you can do that just basically with op amps and transistors and so on. But I didn't want to spend so much time designing that and I just wanted to get something done really quickly. So of course I went through the digital route. And here's what I came up with. It's a Frankenstein of components that I had lying around just to get the job done. So what we have on this are two buck boost converter power supply. These are pretty inexpensive. You can buy them for just a few dollars. And what they do is that they are able to drive anything in either a constant current or a constant voltage configuration. They typically come with two potentiometers. One potentiometer controls the output voltage and the other potentiometer sets the output current limit. So if the current being taken from this is above the amount that it is programmed to deliver, it will run into a constant current, just like a regular power supply would. So these are perfect for driving those LEDs. So I just simply removed the current control potentiometers and I took the analog voltage that used to be created with that potentiometer and I took it and I connected it to a DAC. So now we have a DAC with multiple outputs and the DAC can control the maximum current set on each of these two completely independently. And that is driven then by an Arduino. So basically what I can do is I can set the top LED anywhere I want in brightness and I can set the bottom LED anywhere I want in brightness and I can even set them at the same time, which is something the oscilloscope, the uh, microscope I should say, cannot actually do. Now what about the voltages coming into it? Well I have a couple of terminals over here. So basically I connect the voltage for the top halogen here and the bottom one here and I just simply divide it and I sample it using the Arduino. Now because this is a halogen driver it needs some load so I have some power transistor over here and some capacitors to make sure that there's some load seen by the microscope. That was a power supply that doesn't really like that and I have a potentiometer here to divide that voltage so that the 0 to 12 volt coming from the microscope translates to 0 to 5 volt into the ADC of the Arduino. So Arduino is now basically constantly sampling the voltage seen from these two ports and adjusts and sets the limit for the current set by these two DC-DC converters. That's it. That's really all it is doing. It's very quite straightforward. So I just mail this out. There's a minor mistake in there that I had to do a budge wire. I only made one version of this PCB so I really wanted to get it out of the way. And that's it. So all we have to do is connect these two connectors that they already have the appropriate plugs at the end, connect them to the power supply that comes from the actual microscope, and we're done. And the source of this has to come from a different power supply, because remember that the power supply from the microscope is just varying from 1 to 12. So I have a separate 12 volt power supply that I feed this whole thing with, and everything is actually fully isolated. It works really well. Let me show you. Here we go, everything's plugged in, and right now the microscope is at the lowest intensity and using the bottom light. So if you look at the currents, you can see that this one is active, and this one is at zero. If I crank up the microscope's light intensity, you can see the bottom one's current increases, like so. And if I just jump to the top one, you can see that immediately switches to the top one. So now the top LED is being driven. And I can just do this back and forth without any issues, like so. And this is again very convenient because whenever you change a lens on this microscope or you move any of the objectives around, it actually dims the light to protect your eyes. So that interconnection within the interactions of the lenses and different filters and the microscope's internal light is pretty important to preserve because it's a, it's a, you know, a crucial part of its operation. So now that it all works, let's look at some samples. So what we're looking at here is a tiny piece of a napkin. So these are the fibers inside the napkin looking at it at 50 times magnification. So this is a th transmission type microscopy where the light is going through the sample so the illumination is from the bottom. Now for a sample like this, it's quite difficult to see the individual fibers like this although you get very good contrast. But if you switch the microscope to dark field, dark field microscopy captures only the refracted light from the sample and the image would look very different. And here's exactly the same sample in dark field. So in dark field, because these fibers are so good at scattering light, the background can be completely hidden and some beautiful images can be captured this way. And so there's so much detail in such a tiny sample. But I think maybe my favorite is using polarization because of the way these particular fibers move and shift the polarization planes and you can see some very cool effects. So you have the same fibers looking at it a little bit closer. I'm going to bring in a pro polarization plate into the picture here and take a look. And I can shift the polarization and some of the details of the fiber come out so much more because they move the polarization angle and rotate the polarization in different ways or filter different polarization planes. The effect can be really mesmerizing, especially if you weren't expecting it. So depending on what you put under the microscope, you get totally unexpected result, which is always really fun to see. So here's, for example, a particular area where you can see the strains on the pooling on the fibers has the effect of moving the polarization differently between samples. 
we can also bring a lambda plate into the picture. And a lambda plate allows you to change the background color too as it shifts. There's a lambda delay in there with respect to the polarization plate. So you can get some really incredibly beautiful effects. I mean, look at this. If I showed you, showed you this photo and told you this was just a piece of napkin, you would never believe it. But that's really what it is. And that's what polarization combining with different kinds of filters can do. The effect is really beautiful. And here we are looking at an ant from underneath. The amount of detail is, again, amazing. I think every human being should look through a microscope and a telescope with their own eyes in their lifetime. It really puts us in our place, gives significance to the really, really large and the really, really small, and all the life that can be in a single drop of water. I think this is an experience kids can really benefit from and appreciate how complex life actually is and how fragile it is at so many levels. Now, in this image, we're using dark field again, so you can see the, the fact that the background is blurred out. But we can also combine this effect with other things. We can add polarization and see the effect of how light travels through the ant's body. I think the point may be better illustrated with this. This is a honeybee's leg. And as you can see, this is a joint between two parts of its body. And it's difficult to see what's going on internally. But again, with polarization, you can bring some of those features out and get some really interesting effects. So here we go. I can turn this and to get the, the right angle. Look at that. Now you can really see all the individual little hairs that come out of the body as well as the complex structure of the knee that connects those two pieces together. It's really amazing how much detail there is there. So of course there's a lot more we can talk about here, but I just wanted to show you a couple of things that we normally don't look at on this channel, biological things, which are always fascinating. But at the same time, I have a lot of chips that I want to reverse engineer and show you on the channel, which I will do in a different video. If there is something in particular you want to see, let me know. As always, I'll talk to you in the comment section.